Please welcome the director of DARPA's Microsystems Technology Office, Dr. Mark Rosker. It's December 16, 1947, and two Bell Labs researchers are fiddling with a new contraption in their laboratory. Their names are John Bardeen and Walter Breton, and the device they are experimenting on is based on ideas developed by their colleague, Bill Shockley. It is composed of the miracle material of its day, a semiconductor called germanium. Of course, we are all familiar with the story and we know how it ends. The device called the transistor works. Bardeen, Bratton, and Shockley, and I'll call them BBS, share a Nobel Prize, and it changes the world. When we think about this story from our vantage today, we tend to think of that success as being inevitable, and we focus our attention on the impact the invention made. And there's no question, it led to a lot. And in particular, it led to a lot of transistors. One estimate, which was made in 2018, was that there are 13 sextillion, and a sextillion means 10 to the 21st transistors, have been manufactured since then. And we all know, and this past year has certainly served to remind us, that these transistors have become critical to, well, almost everything we make, to phones, to cars, to medical equipment, to planes, to radars, to everything. But instead of looking backward, let's take a different perspective, a forward-looking one. On that day in December of 1947, it was not inevitable that BBS's contraption would change the world. Not at all. Inventions happen all the time, and most of them lead nowhere. So why did this one change the world? In fact, what went right? Three key lessons stand out, and they are, first, knowing the right question to ask. The transistor was not the great success it became because BBS figured out the right answer. They really didn't. And there are a host of good technical reasons why pretty much none of the next 13 sextillion transistors made in the world look very much like that first one that BBS made. For instance, BBS didn't choose the right material or the right device structure. Shockley himself recognized this pretty much immediately. But Success happened because BBS knew the right question to ask. And that question was, can we build a solid state switch to amplify current? Because that question was the key to displacing the technology of the day, the, the vacuum tube. The right question can lead to a disruptive technology, which leads us then to the next lesson. Number two, creating a viable path to transition. In some respects, the most interesting part of this story might well be the part about how the transistor moved from invention to product. Bell Labs announced the transistor's invention, but it did not provide a path to transition the transistor to applications. That was a critical mistake. So Shockley took matters into his own hands, forming a company to enable the mass manufacture of transistors. Naturally, he called it Shockley Semiconductor, and he located it in Mountain View, California, becoming the genesis of now what we call Silicon Valley. This lesson points to the key role startups have in the electronics ecosystem, then and now. After Shockley's semiconductor, the story becomes complex, with personalities that included Gordon Thiel and Arnold Beckman, Gordon Moore and the Traitorous Eight, and companies like Fairchild Semiconductor, Texas Instruments, and Intel. And while I can't do justice to that story here, the remarkable thing, I think, was the single-minded drive by nearly all involved to transition their technology into real products and new capabilities, which leads to our final lesson, number three, focusing on manufacture. The transistor started as an elegant idea in semiconductor physics, but why it is not just an obscure historical footnote today is because that original idea was quickly supplemented by many more ideas about how to make it, including a healthy degree of what we call advanced prototyping. Shockley's immediate counter to Bardeen and Bratton's point contact transistor was the invention of the junction transistor. While more efficient, Shockley's primary purpose in this innovation was to make a more manufacturable transistor. Similarly, Though the move from germanium to silicon had a physics basis, it was more fundamentally driven by a need to make 
transistors more reproducible and thus more manufacturable. Which brings us to prototyping, something TI was all over. Gordon Thiel, who led the silicon effort at TI, gave a famous talk at the 1954 Institute of Radio Engineers Conference, in which he said, quote, contrary to what my colleagues have told you about the bleak prospects for silicon transistors, I happen to have a few of them here in my pocket. TI hadn't just conceived of a silicon transistor, they'd prototyped it. And TI started production of their product four weeks later. A host of other innovations at Fairchild, at TI, at Intel, and elsewhere soon followed, all focused on making the transistor something that could be built repeatedly and at low cost. Knowing the right question to ask, creating a viable path to transition, and focusing on manufacture. These lessons form a virtuous loop in which manufacturing challenges help inform the next set of questions to go answer. These lessons learned in 1947 and thereafter are meaningful and important to us today. Once again, I'm Mark Rosker, the director of the Microsystems Technology Office, and I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about something critically important to the US and to the Department of Defense. I'd like to talk about making electronics. At this meeting, we are marking the founding 30 years ago of MTO. Many are unaware that MTO was created as a merger of two DARPA offices, the Electronics Systems Technology Office and the Defense Manufacturing Office. The latter was about manufacturing broadly, but microelectronics was already the dominant area for DARPA's research in manufacturing. Throughout its history, MTO has sponsored research that has changed how electronics is made. Some notable examples include microwave monolithic integrated circuits, advanced UV lithography, the FinFET, MOSES, wide band gap semiconductors, and photonic integrated circuits. Today in ERI, we are already thinking and working towards new ways of manufacture. The CHIPS program, for example, has been making the first steps towards disaggregation of large complex circuits into more manageable and more reusable pieces. The PIPES program is incorporating emerging photonics technologies into integrated modules to create energy efficient, high bandwidth microelectronics with potentially disruptive performance. But we have a long ways yet to go. At the 2019 summit, we talked about the emerging fourth wave of microelectronics. What we meant by that was that microelectronics was entering into a new era, leaving behind device scaling and entering into an age where higher performance would be dictated by innovations in the integration of heterogeneous technologies and pushing into three-dimensional architectures. At DARPA, we often speak of a Sputnik moment in which technical surprise unexpectedly occurs. But as we stand on the precipice of the, this fourth wave, I suggest that we are today at a transistor moment, one in which the fundamentals of microelectronics are changing. And at this time, we should consider and respect those lessons we learned on December 16th, 1947, knowing what question to ask, creating a viable path to transition, and focusing on manufacture. Knowing the right question to ask is central to what DARPA does when it does its job well. Some examples of the questions we are thinking about at DARPA today include, will advanced interfaces, things like die-to-die, wafer-to-wafer, die-to-wafer, and so forth, obviate conventional fabrication and packaging? Would assembly approaches allow complex systems to be disaggregated into more basic primitives? How will dense 3D heterogeneously integrated assemblies be designed and tested? Will new manufacturing technologies like fine scale printing and additive manufacture enable precisely aligned lateral interconnects and through substrate vias? How can the electronics within advanced 3D assemblies and packages be powered and how can they be cooled? Are there new materials and thermal strategies to extend temperature operation for 3D assemblies? How will multi-domain integrated EDA tools for 3DHI be achieved? How can complete digital models of 3DHI systems be developed and validated? DARPA ERI must play an important role in this emerging moment for electronics. Two, creating a viable path to transition. 
This needs to be a national focus. Given that only 12% of chips and just 3% of packaging is performed domestically, how do we create ways in which we can lead this fourth wave? Constructs like the National Semiconductor Technology Center will be indispensable. But we as a nation need to play the long game too. As manufacturing technology develops, access to leading CMOS technology is likely to be necessary, but will not be sufficient. At DARPA, we are interested in this long game. How do we build a sustainable path for disruptive innovations to move from the laboratory to industry? And focusing on manufacture. As I've said, we believe that in the next generation in electronics, innovation will be guided not by device scaling alone, but by new ways of assembly and manufacture. The microelectronics of the next decade, indeed the rest of the century, may look very little like the conventional monolithic CMOS chips we have come to know. And the nation that leads in that manufacture will dominate electronics for the next generation. So, how if we think we know the right question and we recognize that manufacture is key, how do we reestablish manufacturing preeminence? At DARPA, we think this will happen by developing disruptive new technologies that fundamentally change how microelectronics is produced. As we move from ERI to ERI 2.0, DARPA announces the addition of two new thrust areas. The first, as Deb Palmer discussed yesterday, is extreme environment electronics. These electronics have numerous applications for the DOD and commercial industry, and MTO feels now is the time to take them on. The second, which will come as no surprise, is manufacturing complex 3D microsystems. Now is the time for the community to push on these technologies and rapidly put them into disruptive systems for the warfighter and domestic industry. As part of the manufacturing thrust, we will continue the dialogue we have been having towards the goal of getting advanced technologies prototyped and into the hands of transition partners and users. This includes continuing to develop the microelectronics technologies in ERI and all of the MTO thrust areas. We will also be working with our government partners, industry, and academia to determine if a public-private partnership in advanced microelectronics manufacturing and heterogeneous integration is something we can make a reality over the next year. MTO and ERI will continue to do great things as long as we have the support and talent of this community. We thank all of you for your time and attention over the last two days. And we are already looking forward to the next time we do this and hoping that it can be together and in person. Welcome to day three the final day of the 2021 ERI Summit. And now, presenting a fireside chat with Mr. Vern Boyle, Corporate Vice President of the Advanced Processing Solutions Business Unit for the Networked Information Solutions Division within Northrop Grumman's Mission Systems Sector. Here we are with Mr. Vern Boyle, Vice President of the Advanced Processing Solutions Business Unit for the Networked Information Solutions Division at Northrop Grumman's Mission Systems. Good morning, Mr. Boyle. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Carl. Thanks for having me. Thank you, and we're glad to have you. And what we want to do this morning is get your thoughts on a few areas. We've talked uh, in the past about collaborations with commercial industry. We've talked about where things are going with regard to uh, electronics for extreme environments. We've talked about how you know ERI can work with government and, and, and the DIB and commercial. So a few things uh, I'll go through, and let's just get your, your thoughts on those. So the first is where are some areas where Northrop Grumman collaborates with commercial electronics industry what are the reasons and benefits motivating this collaboration? Sure, yeah, that, that's a great question, Carl. And I would say, you know, first that electronics are, are a critical aspect of just about everything we, we make in, in Northrop Grumman for our customers. There's really hardly any system you can think of that isn't dependent on microelectronics in some way. And we work with commercial industry both on um, – you know, the, the design and, and development of custom products. Uh, so we really work across the whole spectrum of suppliers from design tools, EDA tools, uh, foundry services, packaging, test. Um, you know, we, we work a lot on uh, emulation capabilities uh, with our EDA uh, vendors. So, you know, a lot of... Um, really important relationships across every aspect of the supply chain. We also have our own foundry capabilities within Northrop Grumman. So we also 
We'll at times uh, build some of our own custom devices when we can't have them fabricated uh, through uh, commercial partners. And so we'll work also with uh, uh, the foundry equipment uh, suppliers and, and service providers. So really we're, we're involved with almost every aspect of commercial supply chain. Okay. How do you feel that's going? How do you feel that that has worked so far with uh, NG? And, and what directions do you see going? Especially, uh, I'll, I'll kind of jump ahead in light of the supply chain shock we saw last year with COVID. And how has that impacted the things that you've done or the things that you'd like to do moving forward? Well, overall, I'd say the, the relationship with all of our uh, partners around the commercial industry are very good. Um, you know, as you know, there are also challenges, you know, the, the defense industry is always competing with commercial industry with respect to volume and scale. And so, um, you know, when we're designing a, a custom component or we're working on, on getting materials or, or really any aspect of the production life cycle, uh, it, there is some work to do to, uh, keep ourselves at the front of the queue, if you will. Uh, but I think we do a, a decent job of forecasting and working with uh, the supply chain on that. You know, the, the issue with the COVID uh, events and, and the things that you're seeing around the industry with the availability of parts really hits across the board, uh, whether it be a, a typical commercial product like an FPGA or other custom components, you know, it's really forced us to yeah, look at our lead times, really forecast uh, out in front with, with some of the vendors. Um, it, we try to avoid having that couple back into the schedule for our programs. Uh, so we've really had to work hard to, to address um, what you're seeing. Has that had any other impact in terms of how you're doing your manufacturing? I know that, again, in the business world, uh, just-in-time manufacturing is a big thing. Realize that it's a little different uh, on, in, in the dev because of the, the time scale of the components and, and, and the overall platforms that you're delivering. But has that impacted uh, your organization at all? I think we've been able to head off the impacts from the, the point of view of the customer. You know, for the most part, we've been able to maintain the delivery of our end items, but it isn't without some uh, some interesting maneuvering uh, during the, the manufacturing okay. and production process. So, um, you know, we have gotten a, a few surprise calls along the way where uh, suddenly materials aren't available, or we'll get a call that says, well, you know, that thing that you were expecting to get in two months is now gonna take 10 months. And, mm. you know, fortunately, you know, we've been able to work around some of that. We've been able to uh, negotiate some shorter timelines with some of the suppliers. Other times we've had inventory and we can work around delays. Um, but it, it's definitely something we have to be aware of moving forward. And, and I think we just have to, you know, look at some of these things more as long lead materials now, whereas maybe in the past they weren't necessarily considered long lead. Okay. So given that, are there areas that you'd like to see the defense industry work a little more closely with the commercial electronics industry? And if so, why? Yeah, I think some of the conversation now around uh, onshoring of capabilities and, and the overall security of the supply chain, I think mm -hmm. is something we're very interested in. Um, you know, the discussions around onshoring certain uh, parts of the, of the process, whether it be you know, the advanced node foundry piece, which is, of course, the biggest problem uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the whole process. Um, but, you know, there are other aspects of the supply chain that I think we're interested in, in working with and helping with uh, packaging, testing, um, bumping, dye. You know, there, there's a number of steps other than just the advanced node foundry that I think we need to look at strengthening uh, across this nation. Um, the supply chain generally tends to be fragile. Uh, there are a number of cases where there are single source suppliers. And as you know, in, in the defense industry in particular, the platforms that we're, we're building for have very long life cycles. You know, 20, 30 years is not unusual. And so we need to figure out how to work across the industry so that those components and those parts are available or, or there's some alternative that can be made available to support the life cycle of the platform. So 
those are um, some areas that I think are are interesting. I think when we look at investments to strengthen our our national capabilities, you know, we need to look not just at advanced node foundries, but really all the other aspects of the supply chain, and then the unique uh, applications that are within the defense industry itself. Okay, let's pull on that thread a little bit. So uh, let's we're going to get away from uh, state of the art CMOS silicon and what material systems, uh, what um, topologies, what are you thinking about in terms of where we could and potentially should focus uh, our efforts, including research efforts moving forward? Yeah. Well, you know, DARPA has been driving a lot of that uh, over the last several years. And, you know, we're very fortunate to be partnered with you on, on many of those opportunities. Okay. Um, there's still an ongoing need to, to drive, uh, you know, wideband RF, uh, digital sensing, um, you know, high power RF applications for digital arrays and multifunction uh, systems. Okay. I think that's... Uh, have made some great strides in that in recent years, and there's some really interesting capabilities. I think there's more that we can keep working on there, uh, including some of the initiatives around advanced packaging, um, you know, mixed materials in, in a common package and or uh, mixed combinations of dye for, for mixed signal and RF processing. I think the push for digital sensing has created a need for advanced computing as well. And I think, you know, there's, there would be uh, some interesting opportunities to figure out how we can, you know, work on new computing uh, paradigms, new chip technologies for acceleration or computing. Because um, there's a lot of data coming off of those digital arrays. And, and you know, yes. being able to process all of that is, is a natural thing, I think, for us to be working on. Okay, so you're talking in effect about uh, an area that we've been discussing here at the summit, which is three-dimensional heterogeneous integration. And so from the perspective of a Northrop Grumman, what are some of the things that you'd like to potentially see integrated together in a package that could, again, push your capabilities forward? Well, I think, you know, one of the things uh, that, that we work on is security. Um, so, you know, to the extent that you can address security through uh, combinations of components and, and packaging, I think, is interesting. Um, I think being able to have any type of pre-processing function co-located with any kind of digital uh, RF capability is, is helpful, and it can alleviate some of the downstream high-power uh, computing that a customer might have to deal with otherwise. Um, I think just in general, the ability to sort of reuse dye in, in different future uh, packaging implementations is interesting. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, shorten the life cycle or shorten the time that it takes to get something to the field. Uh, maybe you're, you're swapping out one component or one dye in a package and reusing, you know, 80% of the other dye and other components, I think is, is good. Um, anything that increases the density of components, um, particularly around digital arrays and, and RF systems, um, the more compact we can make something, it creates a lot of uh, opportunity for the customers to use it on a wider variety of platforms. And so I think those sorts of uh, capabilities are really important. Okay. And that also ties into some things that we've been thinking about here. So I'll take a, a, a slight change. We've been talking about uh, microelectronics for uh, harsh or extreme environments. How would that play into some of uh, NG's uh, capabilities moving forward? Well, I think there's, you know, a couple of places where I see some things surging, uh, you know, that mm -hmm. I would consider appropriate for the harsh environment. One is uh, all of the, the new activities in space, you know, both on the commercial side, but on the government okay. side. Yeah. You know, the, the access to space has, has gotten easier than it was when I started my career, certainly. And, uh, you know, that has created a lot of opportunity on, on the commercial side and the government side. And so, you know, I think it's necessary to find ways to have parts that can survive in that environment, maybe survive in different ways. 
you know, maybe the life cycle of those platforms isn't 20 years. You know, maybe it's a shorter time frame, less than five years perhaps. So how do we design components that can survive in a space environment um, and, and really help to accomplish that goal of rapid capability to space, but at a low cost. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a, an interesting area. Certainly, you know, radiation hardening is important. Um, mm -hmm. And that's probably the, the most interesting area, I think. Okay. So from what you've mentioned, it also ties into something that, again, we've been thinking about and talking about, and that is the need for a rapid prototyping, because you mentioned the, the idea of, hey, instead of having uh, a, a super long life cycle, if you could design something, get it tested and, and prototyped and actually into uh, a, a program record sooner. So what are some of the ways that that would benefit you, and what are some of the things that you could see that you could even use right now if we had the ability to do more rapid prototyping? Well, I think, you know, rapid prototyping first, I would say, has a couple of different forms uh, with respect to microelectronics. And there's okay. some really good capabilities for hardware emulation right now. And, and I think when I think of, of prototyping, I think first of, of emulating the capability in a virtual environment um, yes. Sort of taking a cue from digital transformation, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can we build the the die? Can we build the part virtually before we tape it out? And can we verify the design? Can we uh, identify all the all the issues in the in the routing uh, of the design? Can we run the software on the part and verify that it works? Can mm -hmm. we verify the memory transactions and the data rates and the speeds? All the things that tend to bite you after you've uh, taped yes. out a die and you, you move into tests and you realize, oh, I got to spin this thing again. Um, right. That, that respin is where you sort of create a lot of schedule and cost problems. And so I think when we talk about prototyping, the emulation part is really important. Um, and then, you know, ideally you can, you can tape things out once and, and that should cut the cost and cut the schedule considerably. Um, the other thing that I think it, and I know you guys have been thinking about this and, and working on approaches for this, but, you know, in the defense industry and a, a facilitator for getting the defense and commercial industry to work together are sort of continuous pipelines of tape outs. You know, mm -hmm. we, we might have a program that looks at a particular application uh, or a particular type of device, and then that program ends. And sometimes the, the device will have life after the program, and sometimes mm -hmm. it doesn't. Yes. Um, and, and so I think, you know, if we could prototype and or have uh, chains of, of, of tape outs with, with programs that have a longer time frame to them, you know, multiple years, and, and maybe there, there are areas that just keep going, and, and you, you have this ability to spin die quickly. And, and continue to improve and evolve some of the concepts that you might be researching. Um, the other end, this really isn't prototyping, but I think it's an important aspect of, of maybe, you know, ERI and the relationship between defense and commercial industry. Being able to take an, a part that might have been prototyped in a DARPA project, or maybe you, you built a few samples of it, mm -hmm. and it, and it works, but getting it to the point where you're able to achieve yields, you're able to make that part reliably, you know, you're able to, to increase the, the scale of the production, it, it, you know, that part is often neglected, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of walking us through the, the emulation part of the life cycle, mm -hmm. the, a, a mm -hmm. concept of continuous rapid prototyping, but then, you know, I think there's something needed to allow those parts to get into, uh, you know, some higher yield production. So how do you think DARPA could help with that? Well, I think one thing DARPA is doing now that, that's really helpful, and I, and I really applaud DARPA for doing this, is you know creating projects that allow commercial industry and defense companies to work together. You guys have okay. numerous examples of that, and again, we've, we've been fortunate to partner with you on many of those. But I think you know a defense company 
typically need some kind of, of government funding to work on something. And, and so that's important for us. You know, commercial industry is often looking for what the commercial play is. You know, is, is something about this project going to support, support their commercial goals? So I think, you know, I look at, at ERI or, or the project initiatives or the strategic areas you've identified, you know, can we, can we find things that can persist over long periods of time? You know, less one-off projects, more, you know, here's a thread of investment in computing. Here's a thread of investment in communication technology. Here's threads in AI, quantum, you know, strategic areas where we can be working together, you know, with commercial and defense industry partners, um, mm -hmm. again, iterating uh, chip technologies uh, over long periods of time, I, I think is, uh, is a, 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 an aspect of ERI it, to be considered. Okay. Uh, so let me make another shift and ask you a little bit about how you see the advancements in uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and what Northrop Grumman is doing with them. Does it appear on your roadmaps and, and, and how are you incorporating that into uh, your, your plans? Yeah, well, it's certainly on our roadmaps. Um, okay. it, it's a very important strategic area uh, for the nation, for our customers. They've stated that outright. It's hard to pick mm -hmm. up a, a mm -hmm. document from a customer describing their future vision without hitting AI on the first page. Okay. Um, so it's important to us because it's important to our customers. And, you know, we're investing in those capabilities. We have a, a number of, of programs where we're developing those capabilities and getting them out to the field. Um, I think it's fair to say that AI will probably touch every aspect uh, of the defense industry and, and the types of systems that our customers depend on. Sensing, communications, weapon mm -hmm. systems, uh, platforms, decision-making tools, command and control. Now, it's hard to talk about those applications and not have something about AI creep in. And so it's very important strategically, and, and we are uh, focused on that. From a microelectronics perspective, I think there's an important role with respect to AI. And you see this in commercial industry. Um, a lot of companies working on driverless vehicle technologies have their own uh, chip designers. You know, they're making their yes. own processors, you know, including Tesla and others. Um, why are they making their own chips? Well, because they need to perceive, they need to reason, uh, they need to consume a lot of sensor data. They need to do a lot of the same things our customers care about. So when you look at you know, commercial AI applications, uh, you see inside custom microelectronics, All right? So I, I think AI is important, and I think that there's opportunity to, to research and develop uh, purpose-built microelectronics for AI, certainly. Do you see the defense industry moving in a similar direction? I mean, granted, I understand that there's a difference in terms of the size of the potential design teams on, on you know, between commercial and defense, but do you see the, the need or, or that capability to reside within the defense community as well, given some of the specialized applications and specialized uh, requirements that, are, that exist? Hey, there's a lot of work going on in the defense industry and with, with defense customers for AI. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it started out initially as, um, you know, machine learning, really. You know, I think some people right. use machine learning interchangeably with uh, AI, even though it's not really the same thing. Um, but, yeah. you know, machine learning applications for sensor data processing is where it, it started. Um, there's a lot of initiatives now, I'm sure you're familiar with, where... Um, intelligent systems are being developed and, and tested, you know, mainly in the S&T community. Uh, drone swarms, uh, intelligent platforms, right. uh, autonomously yep. controlled systems. Uh, there's a lot of work at DARPA for those very things. And, and you guys have been, I think, a leader in, in that area. And so I think the question now is, you know, what does it take to move from the S&T environment into the operational environment? And is there a, a system in place uh, across our government to do that? Um, I, think, I think we're really just in the beginning stages of that. There's certainly some very compelling S&T capabilities, and we're mm -hmm. in the very early stages of, I think, making that operational. 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to have another shift for you. Are there things that you think that DARPA could do to help address some of the supply chain security issues, especially when it comes to advanced electronics technologies and capabilities? Um, yeah, I think, you know, again, you're, you're already working on, on many things. So when I answer your question, I don't want to imply that, uh, <laughs> you know, you guys aren't, aren't already driving things very much so. But, you know, there's sort of a couple of aspects of security in, in my mind. You know, there, there's security with respect to availability. You know, is, is mm -hmm. the capability available at all? And, and that's certainly uh, a security issue. So, you know, are, are there things that can be done to improve the availability of, of what we need? Uh, just look beyond the advanced node foundry, but, you know, other techniques for manufacturing, other techniques for packaging, other techniques for the various steps in the microelectronics supply chain, what are the alternatives, All right? And how do we enable companies, you know, or how do we initiate a research initiative that a company could be formed around um, such that we have multiple suppliers and multiple ways to address mm -hmm. that step in the process? Okay. Um, I think that's... Uh, that's important. The other aspect is the security of the devices themselves and, and the integrity of the components that get built through the process. Um, I know you guys have had a number of projects on that. We've helped you with some of them. Um, mm -hmm. It's difficult to implement everything from a, a practical point of view, but I think you, you have to keep working on uh, building trust into the supply chain, even though the supply chain itself may be untrusted. Got it. Got it. So now I'll ask you to kind of look into a crystal ball and say, uh, in five, 10 years from now, what kind of capabilities do you see Northrop Grumman needing? And what are the technologies that you think would fuel realizing that goal? Well, let's see. I, I think we may have touched on some of them already, but uh, so it might be a little bit of a repeat, but let me... Uh, let me see how I can address that question. I think, you know, we're continuing to work on uh, digital sensing, uh, multifunction uh, sensing devices. And so that's going to continue to be an important technology okay. area. All right. Again, I think computing is going to be a very critical application area, and we're going to continue to focus on uh, computing technologies. And I think you can expect to see some very interesting capabilities, including microelectronics around uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, the final piece, of course, is security. Uh, we, we have a lot of capabilities within our company to create secure hardware and, and uh, embed security into our systems, and, and that's going to continue to be a focus area as well. Okay. And speaking of security, do you see uh, useful collaborations with commercial industry in enhancing that security? Absolutely. You know, the, the commercial industry is always improving uh, the security of, of commercial processors, commercial hardware, mm -hmm. the systems that they uh, reside in. And, you know, we, we try to use that to the greatest extent possible. You know, if, if we can utilize a commercial uh, security solution, we'll do that. Uh, it doesn't always uh, address the robust security solutions that some of our customers okay. require. Um, but we'll, we'll use what we can from commercial industry, certainly. Okay. And one final question. What two or three points would you like to leave with uh, our, our audience today, with those that are uh, attending uh, the summit? Well, uh, I guess I would say, um, you know, enjoy the summit, first of all, uh, from an opportunity okay. point of view. I think... Um, you know, being around others in the industry and taking advantage of the of the people. Um, I always find, you know, talking to others in the industry and, you know, understanding their point of view really helps helps advance my thinking on on uh, what what might be important. Um, also, you know, just sort of understanding what the state of the art is, what the state of practice is. Sometimes you you think you got the view or you have the understanding and you Mm -hmm. Start talking to a lot of other folks at an event like the one you're hosting, <laughs> and you realize, wow, it's a big world with a lot of information right. in it. Um, right. So just take it all in, 
And again, I, I thank you for the opportunity to, to come in and talk with you today, Carl. I really appreciate it. This begins the morning break. The MTO Symposium session will commence at 11.30 a.m.